I've re-engaged my inner child. I've realized the importance of play. Welcome to the Drew Perlman Show. Think of this podcast as the antidote to the fear, the noise, and the talking heads in the news. The show features an entertaining blend of ancient wisdom, empowering ideas, and cutting edge, healthy living science to optimize your health and your life. So let's dive in and get started. Today's guest on the show is my friend, Daryl Edwards. Daryl is a former investment banking technologist turned movement coach and author. He is the founder of the Primal Play Method and a physical activity, health, and play researcher. Daryl is author of the best-selling book, Animal Moves, which highlights why humans should move like the animals that we are. Welcome to the show, Daryl. Oh, thanks so much. That was a great introduction, Drew. So uh, it makes me feel even more welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, very, very good. Very good. Um, Daryl, maybe just start briefly by talking a little bit about your your story and how how movement came into your life. Yes. So as you mentioned, I worked, my previous career was working with an investment banking technology, very difficult, demanding work, very long hours, not much sleep, poor diet, very sedentary. That pretty much sums it up. Getting paid lots of money. That's probably the most important part of that work. Then um, I was fortunate enough to have annual health checks, which were pretty intrusive, pretty invasive procedures to find out my state of health and well-being. And one year I was told that I had a series of, of conditions ranging from pre-diabetes. So I was, I was one sort of a tipping point away from full-blown type 2. I had chronic hypertension, so very high blood pressure. I had a very poor lipid profile, which means my cholesterol profile was, wasn't too, looking too good. And I had an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease, so risk of stroke, risk of heart attack. And the recommendation was to take a cocktail of medication, statins, beta blockers to blood pressure, metformin to control blood sugars. And I just remember thinking to myself, I'm sure exercise can certainly help with my blood pressure. So let me try at least getting more active and see what happens. Maybe I can avoid taking at least one of the meds. And what happened after a series of of retests after exercising, uh, my blood pressure came down and my, my lipid profile improved and my blood sugars improved just by exercise. And that became the gateway to consider other aspects of my lifestyle that I wanted to improve in terms of health. And I stayed within banking for several years, but within those years, I started to cross train. I became a personal trainer. I became a nutritional therapist. I got mentored by many, many individuals that I admired. And I started to get fascinated by this sort of, sort of ancestral wisdom, this evolutionary biology lens as to how humans could have a much better existence if they acknowledged their sort of genetic inheritance, I suppose, if they acknowledged what the environment that they evolved under and the conditions they evolved under and where that mismatch exists in the 21st century. And the closer we can get in a kind of non-romantic way, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a practical way, using the best of the present day's evidence and exercise science and nutritional science and and well-being science, if we take all of that with what we know from the past, we might have a better chance of dealing with chronic lifestyle conditions. So that's pretty much what happened. And I left banking. I decided to focus on food initially, on nutrition initially, but I realized I wasn't passionate about it um, and I didn't have anything different to say. But with movement, I felt that I'd, I'd done enough to recognize where there was a problem with, with making physical activity and exercise and movement more accessible. So that's where I wanted to, that's where I wanted to sit. That's where I realized I had a message that was worth sharing and that I was passionate about and that I wanted to deliver to, to, to an audience. That's great, Daryl. Um, Could you talk a little bit? I mean, people listening right now, there's a lot of fear in the world with this coronavirus and just people stuck in their homes. Maybe talk a little Mm. bit about, 
Yeah, I was I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how play and movement could be helpful, maybe a helpful antidote to the fear. Yeah, that's I mean, that's firstly, we have to acknowledge people. I mean, there is a lot of fear. This is very much this is very much an unknown. Um, you know, not many of us have lived through an epidemic or a pandemic on this sort of scale. And this is probably the first time that we've had a, a global response, which means for many of us, we're being told by public health bodies, stay inside. It's a lockdown. You know, don't, um, you know, you have to, you have to take, in part, take part in all of these measures to not only protect you, but to protect society. And, and regardless of your opinion, regardless of whether you believe all of those messages are applicable to you, we certainly know something has happened, something has changed. We may know people who've passed passed away. I certainly uh, um, do. I have family, members of my family that have passed, passed away, friends that have passed away. So there is something different about the, about the present time. And in terms of what we know about the immune system is that stress plays a part. If you're, if you're really stressed, you, that can weaken the immune system response. If you're not eating well, if you're not sleeping well, if you're physically inactive, all those things can have a detrimental impact on immune, immune system behavior. And so even though there may be talk of if you just do the right things, nothing will happen to you. You know, it's just all down to lifestyle. I, I, I can't say I subscribe to that. I believe that lifestyle and health and well-being just significantly reduces the risks of, of things happening to you that are harmful to your health. That's what I that's what I believe. You, it puts you into a better into a better position. And so with physical activity, not only does it help with chronic lifestyle conditions, but it does also help with infectious disease. So it protects us against infectious disease. It protects us from our immune system aging prematurely. So the one thing that pretty much no one would disagree with is the older you get, your immune system tends to be less effective as we age, which is why older adults are at higher risk of a lot of conditions, including infectious disease. But those who are physically active, who maintain good levels of physical activity can maintain a youthful immune system. So we know exercise can help you can help you maintain youthfulness and vitality physically, even maybe aesthetically, but it also can help with the brain cognitively, and it can also help with the health and well-being of the immune system. So that's I think that's I think is a is a wonderful selling point for the benefit of exercise now. And it's why in some parts of the world, the UK included, the public health message included exercise as an, as an exception for being able to go outside. So, you know, if you're going shopping, if, you, if you're going out to exercise, that was permitted here as part of the message of protecting, your, protecting yourself. And probably the last bit to mention of something that's really important to note is as part of the immune system function, the white blood cells are responsible for providing sort of immune support. And even more specific, there are cells called T cells. And these cells are responsible for recognizing you know, antigens, including viruses. So they recognize viruses on the surface of, of cells. And we produce more of those T cells, the more active we are. So of course, there can be too much of a good thing. It's not, it's not a reason to over-exercise or to do too much exercise, but surely a healthy level of physical activity can help the body's defense system, can help these T cells or natural killer cells as, a, as they're also known. So if you want to improve the function of your immune system, not necessarily boost it, because the boosting can be harmful, depending on, on you know, any conditions that you may or may not have, but in terms of boosting the function of the natural killer cells to fight germs, to fight precancerous cells, to fight harmful substances, it's certainly beneficial to be active rather than sedentary. 
Definitely. Um, Daryl, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your great concept of movement snacks as a way to kind of make movement more maybe attainable to people that get a little overwhelmed. What's movement snacks all about? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think when it comes to movement, not necessarily food. <laughs> so food, we most of us would say snacks are not are not a good option for many of us, right? Um, we're better off eating larger meals less frequently um, and have periods of, of not eating. With movement, it's the other way around. We should be engaging in frequent bouts of physical activity and we should be reducing the amount of time spent being sedentary. One of the reasons for that is if I'm sitting you know, for eight hours a day in an office job. And most people would sit far more when they think about working in the office plus the commute where they may be sitting in a car or on, on public transport. Uh, then they come home and they're sitting down watching TV or on a computer. So it's, it's usually a lot more than eight hours. But if you sit for eight hours a day it would, and you exercise for 60 minutes per day at moderate intensity activities, that's, that's going for a run, say, if you run for 60 minutes every single day, that doesn't undo the sixth, sorry, the eight hours of sedentary time. So you have to do quite a lot of physical activity to undo the harmful effects of being sedentary. And so one way to mitigate that is not to necessarily do more exercise, like, hey, let's do two hours exercise a day or three hours exercise a day. One better way is to have lots of movement snacks. So you pretty much break up sedentary activity as often as possible. Um, and two or three minutes here or there of this type of activity accumulates over the day. And that has far more beneficial impact. So small, frequent doses of movement of all intensities are far more beneficial to us than sitting down for lengthy periods and then going, hey, you know what, I'm going to exercise now and then I'm going to go back to sitting down because I'm because I'm tired, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I need to rest. I need to rest now because I've just been exercising um, and I need to be idle for the rest of the time because that's how I, that's what my work dictates. That it's not a physical, it's not physical labor that I need to, to be able to achieve my objectives. I just need to sit and interact with a device for many, many of us. So that's why movement snacks are really important. And even though within my books, like my animal move book, I do create a structured program of saying, right, this is beneficial for the next 15, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Here's a routine that you should focus on. I still mandate try and get as many movement snacks in as possible. So having some structure is good. It helps with discipline. It helps with targeting. It helps with having metrics as to what you have and haven't done. But taking opportunities for more movement as and when you can. So I'll give you a practical example. The amount of times I've spent watching my kettle boil when I'm making some tea, for example, two minutes, three minutes to boil. Then I put the water in, a, in, the, in the mug. Then I watch it, you know, <laughs> wait a few minutes for the tea to brew and I'm scanning the phone or whatever I'm doing to pass the time. I could be doing some movement then, you know, knock out a few squats, do a few push-ups. you know, tea's ready. Great. I've just done, you know, done a couple of minutes of movement. Um, so there's lots of those opportunities when you think about it, where you don't need more time in your day. You can just use that time more efficiently and more effectively and integrate movement into your, into your day, I think is probably the best way. Incidental movement is probably the best way of getting out of the rut and feeling less overwhelmed. That's awesome. Wow. Um, Daryl, something else that you've said before that I really love is you said that wherever I am is the best gym. What do you, what do you mean when you say wherever I am is the best gym? Yeah, well, you know, the best, I would say, I'll expand that slightly. So one, wherever I am is, is the best gym. Whatever environment I'm in is the best gymnasium, which means there's a, almost an infinite variety of activities, physical activities I can perform wherever I am, whether that's in my living room, limited space, you know, in a hotel room, or if I'm in a great outdoors. So whether I'm in a small a back garden, or in a park, or in an even greater expanse of space, there are so many things we can do 
interacting with the environment, interacting with nature, to almost exploit the capabilities of physical movement for us as human beings. The second thing is that the best equipment we own is our own human bodies, regardless of the limitations, regardless of what we're trying to deal with. You know, we don't have any other equipment apart, you know, with us at every single time apart from ourselves, right? <laughs> Even our phone has to get charged. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like we, we, there are no, there are no devices that we, that we live with 24 seven. So the best equipment we own is ourselves. The best gym is whatever environment we're, we're in. The reason I like that, the psychology of that is because again, it gives me more opportunities to move more. It gives me more opportunities to be playful with movement, to, you know, not be constrained by once I get home, then I can do some exercise. Actually, not even once I get home. Usually it's like once I get home, I can then get my gym kit, then I can go to the gym. And then once I'm in the gym, then I can do my session. Or once I, I'm actually at the gym at the right time, then I can do the, a particular class. Or if I'm doing an online session, once I have internet access, you know, <laughs> then, I can, then I can do this class that's running virtually, say. And, and because of that, that world means there are so many limitations, there are so many barriers. If you don't arrive at the gym at the right time, you might miss your class. So you go, you know what, I'm not gonna bother doing anything. If you don't have the right equipment, if you don't have the right training shoes, oh, you know what, I don't look good in this outfit. Maybe this, maybe it's not for me. You know, the peer pressure involved in, in, in gym environments or thinking about how people look or should, or perform certain movement patterns. If you remove all of that and you just think about, isn't it great to see what my body's capable of, to challenge myself, to be curious about me and the environment you're in, then you have a, a much better time of achieving the objective. You know, I'll give you a, a last example on that. I, I had an appointment and I was on my way back home for this podcast and I was, and I was rushing to get, back, to get back on time. So I was bobbing and weaving in between people. You know, it was an interesting navigation to get back. I was rushing, I didn't wanna run, but I was, it was a seriously brisk walk. And you know, you, you're almost like a pinball trying to avoid, you know, like avoid, you know, avoiding people and making it really interesting. And I'm literally bobbing and weaving down my, down my high street. I get home, I sprint up the stairs. You know, it's, 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 it's a great way to think, just think how much movement I got in just on me getting, just deciding to get home quickly to sprint up the stairs. You know, I, I set up my computer, I bear crawl across my living room floor, then we start speaking. You know, like, it's like, that was pretty much my, my pre-podcast play out, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But it was based on, I had to get home anyway. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like I planned for that to happen. It was like, no, I have to get home, I'm outside. How can I get home quickly? How can I get home in a, quickly that's going to be fun for me? and make me feel really good about what's coming up next, which was this podcast. So it's, it's a very childlike way, I think, of approaching opportunities for movement. It's a fun way of thinking about movement. It's not a punitive way. It's not a punishing way. And that's what many adults, that's where they, they sort of miss a trick. It's because they sometimes look for the, give me the hardest, most intense, most brutal uh, experience imaginable which is why we use the word workout. It's like, let's work out in a gym hard, beat myself up. I want to be able to brag to people how hard I worked. That's what, me, that's what makes a difference. If I'm playing, if I'm enjoying myself, mm, is that valuable? Certainly it's valuable to, to our physiology, to our body. Our body tells us it feels good. Our body responds in a positive, in a positive way. Our mind feels great. We want to do it again. We get better endorphin rushes, the feel-good hormones, serotonin, dopamine. We get natural responses to all those feel-good hormones. So, yeah, there was so much. There was so much richness and in information and research on this, and I cover a lot of that on my website uh, in a lot of detail for those who who would like to dig a bit deeper and find out more. You know, Daryl, I know just one other thing on this. I mean, I know play is a huge part of your work and the power of play, and I and I've heard you say before that. You know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, 
but I know what's happening right now. And somehow play brings us into that present moment. Maybe just speaking again, back to that whole fear element, people that are in fear, how can we sort of play our way back into the, the present moment? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really difficult for adults. Um, I mean, I, I, I haven't always been playful myself. It, it wasn't an, uh, uh, you know, this wasn't an easy transition for me. You know, maybe if I'd worked as a kindergarten school, you know, kindergarten school teacher or something like that. And do you know what I mean? Or spent time in education or spent time working with, with kids or something like that. Maybe, maybe that would have been my entire life or, or being a comic or, or, you know, worked in the circus. But no, I was dearthly serious couldn't couldn't have a smile on my face because I'd, I'd be concerned I'd get fired, you know, in my previous my previous role. And when I started working out, I didn't. I wanted to train like a Spartan. Do you know what I mean? I wanted to be. I want to feel feel like I was being beaten up by Tyson, doing ten rounds with Tyson every time I was in the in the gym. You know, so so it was all deadly serious, with no joy. Now I realise. That play is also serious, but there's a seriousness which also realizes joy. So for children, when they're playing, when they're playing in the purity, the, the, a pure essence of play for a child, they don't choose the easy options. They choose risky, challenging. I may not be successful when I attempt this. Let's see if it's possible. Let's see what I can risk assess, risk manage, communicate, evaluate, you know, all the, all of these processes are going on to ensure that they're having, uh, you know, an enjoyable time. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's always fun. They may, ha they may be scared. There's, there's fear in a lot of the childhood games. Being chased isn't always fun when you're being chased, you know, playing tag, for example, you know, <laughs> Sometimes it's really, it, you know, there's a, a certain type of fear, which is like, oh, my goodness, this is really uncomfortable. I don't want to get caught. You know, so we forget that as adults, I feel we, we think that play is just about hilarity and laughter and having fun and rolling around in the hay and, you know, popping balloons or whatever you picture a, a, as a child playing. But no, it was like climbing a tree and there's a risk you might fall. There was jumping probably a little bit further than we could. And let's hope we're going to get there because if we don't, we, it's, it's probably going to be twisted ankle time or do you, do you know what I mean? Like attempting things that we see the older kids doing, even though you're not quite, can I, can I do this? Is it possible? Tell me how you did this. Teach me, communicate with me. You know, there's, so there's all these things that happened through play as kids that we dismiss as adults or we try to overly protect them now as adults. We remove, we remove all of that, all of those conversations. We remove the risk. We add uh, unnecessary supervision. And as adults, we're, we are like, play for us is, is very similar. If I'm playing, it has to be done in this very structured, supervised way where we say there's going to be value in doing this. Otherwise, I'm not going to bother doing it. Um, and that's what I, I suppose I've realized. I've re-engaged my inner child. I've realized the importance of play. I've realized that play for a kid is not just having fun, but it's serious. It's, it's, I don't want to say hard work, but it's, it's, it's intense. It's serious. It's fulfilling. It challenges them. It really stretches them far more than I feel many of the things that we get our children to do in the present. They can stretch themselves far more than we give them credit for. And certainly for me, being a Generation X kid, I would never swap my childhood experiences of free play with anything that a child can engage with today. Because, because it's a, it's, I feel it's a very sanitized virtual world that they have, but they are missing out on so many experiences that came about from just going outside and playing. You know what I mean? Like your parents have said, get out of the house. <laughs> you know? Come back when dinner's ready. Come back when the sun goes down. Don't get into any mischief. <laughs> and and that was that was your day. And and you had to make you you made sure by and large that you had an incredible time with your friends, and those summer days that would last forever. And so many kids have never had one of those days, not even one. 
And as a child, for me, most of my free time was spent playing. That's all we pretty much lived for. Now, children are living for what's on TV, what's on my computer, what's on my smartphone, what we're doing next, that's structured. You know, that seems to be what children live for today. And we, we don't appreciate why they're being challenged mentally, emotionally, stress stresses that they that they're having that that are purely because they're not being given these opportunities to express themselves uh, through play so yeah i mean i know we're limited on time and i could talk about that one subject alone but there's a reason why there's a bit of kickback now on what's termed free range children of there are adults who are realizing there is something missing from a childhood today then 30, 40, 50 plus years ago that isn't being replaced with all of the benefits that come with the 21st century. All of the things that they have, all the materials that they have, all of the comforts that they have, all the security that lots of children have now that many of us didn't have but a generation or two ago. There's something really at the core is missing. And I think people are realizing play and free play is a huge part of that, of what's missing. So, of course, it doesn't mean everything was great. You know, I don't want to sound like, you know, my dad, <laughs> you know, it was, everything was so great back then. And, you know, it's like, no, I'm happy that I wear a seat belt in the car. I'm happy that, you know, I can go somewhere and people don't smoke. Do you know what I mean? My teachers used to smoke when I was a kid in, in the staff room. <laughs> you know, like, you know, people smoked inside hospitals. They smoked in the workplace. So there's so many things that are for the better. But I think in relation to play, that's certainly one of the things that we need to be bringing back. We need to go back to go forward, to go forwards. Absolutely. Um, Daryl, two final questions here. Th- these are questions I ask all of my guests that are on the show. Um, the first one is for anyone listening who's feeling a little powerless, hopeless about their life, about their future, what might be one thing, if you had to recommend just one thing that they could do today to begin to take their life in a new direction, what, what would you recommend, Daryl? Uh, physical activity again. It's one of the things that we all, we all have some control over is what our bodies are capable of doing, which is why one of the reasons if I go for a walk, if I've got a lot of worries, which all of us have had, all of us have had different worries anxieties to different degrees, of course, over the last few months. But some of the best parts of my day have been when I've gone outside for a walk, just gone to the park for a walk, looking at nature, and and your mind just drifts away and doesn't think about those things that are there when you're just sitting down, when you're being idle and your mind just kind of goes over and over and over these things. Hippocrates said, if you're in a bad mood, go for a walk. If you're still in a bad mood, go for another walk. And that's, that's basically what I would recommend. Do something that engages your body. And it's incredible how beneficial that is for your mind. It doesn't mean those things don't have to be dealt with, of course, those worries and concerns. But it's amazing how many of them will seem less important. It's amazing how many worries you can and problems you can solve whilst walking that that you know you have better solutions for whereas previously you felt it was a brick wall and that's why movement is so beneficial for a lot of um, of mental health issues you know it reduces anxiety it reduces depression it reduces it improves resilience that's what i would recommend for people great um daryl final question if you had the opportunity to travel back in time say 35 40 years what words of, it, of wisdom might your current self share with your younger self? Ooh, <laughs> 35, 40 years. Um, I'd probably say, um, wow. <laughs> it's a tough one. Things, yeah, things will, I, I'll probably say to myself, things will, uh, things will get better but things will largely still be the same. That's what I, that's what I would say to myself. Fair enough. Like, you know, yeah, embrace, I suppose, kind of embrace the, the things that are 
that are beneficial changes, but recognize that there are still many things at the core that that won't that won't necessarily change within your lifetime. Uh, and and there has to be some acceptance of that rather than just constantly thinking about, you know, hopefully things will get better. Hopefully things will get better. Sometimes you just have to stay in the moment, I suppose. That's just, that's probably what it would be. Spend more time staying in the moment. And that doesn't mean signing up to a mindfulness course. It just means, it just means you know, life is short and just really think about where you are right now. Um, yes. Thank you for listening to The Drew Perlman Show. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. In the words of the old Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So here's to getting started today, right now. Living with awareness, living with intention, and living with purpose. Stay well, everyone.